So I recently watched The Mummy the Animated Series. It was like, it wasn't good, <laughs> but it also wasn't bad enough to be interesting. You know, I was kind of hoping that I would either find like this hidden gem or something bad enough that I could kind of dunk on it for 15 to 30 minutes for the content. I don't really do like thing bad stuff on my channel. It's not really my vibe, but thing bad content does tend to do really well on youtube.com and I guess now it's time to pledge my fealty to the algorithm, so I would have made an exception for some bad mummy content, of which there is plenty. But the animated adaptation of Stephen Summers' The Mummy isn't really bad in a way that makes it distinct from other Universal Animated Studio schlock, which consists almost entirely of cheaply made direct-to-video cash grabs based on existing IPs, including, but not limited to, all of the Land Before Time sequels, Hercules and Xena the Animated Movie, an animated prequel to Stephen Summers' Van Helsing starring Hugh Jackman and Kate Beckinsale, and The Adventures of Br'er Rabbit. Oof. So yeah, The Mummy the Animated Series almost kind of feels like the cream rising to the top when you compare it to some of the other things coming out of the same studio at the same time. I mean, the animation is very clearly on a budget, but it's not like offensively bad. It's certainly better than some stuff that was coming out of Disney Toon Studios. Originally, I thought that the idea for the animated series had its genesis in the character Alex, Rick and Evie's young son who appears for the first time in The Mummy Returns. The animated series is very loosely based on the characters and events from The Mummy Returns, and it was released in the same year. So I thought maybe the studio heads were like, hey, we've got this sequel to The Mummy that tones down some of the scarier elements and it stars a literal child, so hey, let's, you know, crank out an animated adaptation and maybe get some opportunities to merchandise or get some promotional tie-ins with fast food chains like Taco Bell and Carl's Jr. You know, Taco Bell and Carl's Jr., the fast food chains famous for their kids meal. Anyway, now that I know that there's also an animated adaptation of Van Helsing, I think maybe Steven Summers just really likes cartoons. So like in The Mummy Returns, in The Mummy the Animated Series, the character Alex accidentally puts on a bracelet that has magical powers and that he cannot remove. In the live action film, it's called The Bracelet of Anubis and it kind of functions as a map of sorts, showing Alex and Imhotep who has kidnapped him the route to the oasis in Amsher. It also kind of functions as like the ticking time bomb of the screenplay because it'll destroy the wearer if they don't make it to the pyramid in the oasis of Amsher by sunrise on the fifth day. In the animated series, it's called the Manacle of Osiris and it gives Alex superpowers. <laughs> it's, it's fine, you guys, it's, it's a TV show for kids. Alex is the protagonist of the animated series and you know, accessories are a really easy thing to market to children if you decide to merchandise. But they like go way out of their way to no homo it. Like someone at corporate was like, well, we can't call it the bracelet of Anubis. Bracelets are things that girls wear. There's even a point in the series where another character refers to it as a bracelet and Alex very defensively goes, it's not a bracelet, it's a manacle. Like he thinks bracelet is too feminine a word so he prefers to refer to the piece of jewelry he wears as a manacle. The thing that we associate with imprisonment and slavery. It, it was the early 2000s guys. <laughs> It was a dark time. Also like in The Mummy Returns, Evie is the reincarnation of Princess Nefertiri. But uh, in the character design stages, they, uh, they changed some things. So Evie and Jonathan canonically are half Egyptian, half European, a 
Yike, I pointed out in my first mummy video as they are played by notably not Egyptian actors, John Hanna and Rachel Weisz. But you know, at least with their complexions and their hair and eye color, Hanna and Weisz kind of seem like, you know, they could at least pass as, as half North African and half European. I mean, there are plenty of Algerians and, and Egyptians that are very light-skinned, but um, in the animated series, Evie gets passed through a whitening filter. <laughs> like, they give her very explicitly Northern European features. Jonathan and Evie and Alex all have red hair and blue eyes. And at first I thought, well, maybe within this universe, they're not half Egyptian, they're, they're just British. Which honestly could be the case for Jonathan. Uh, but Evie is, is definitely the reincarnation of Nefertiri. And when she is Nefertiri, the only way you can tell Evie and Nefertiri apart is by their accent. Nefertiri has an American accent. Which, I mean, to be fair, is no more anachronistic than British RP. So yeah, the uh, lightening up of Jonathan and Evie just makes me super uncomfortable. <laughs> like, like whose note was that? Who, who looked at Rachel Weisz and was like, nah, -uh, no, um, make her look more like Poison Ivy from Batman the Animated Series. Unlike The Mummy Returns, but more consistent with the third movie, The Mummy Tomb of the Dragon Emperor, Alex in the animated series has an American accent. In The Mummy Returns, he's got a British estuary accent that's consistent with his posh London upbringing. And the accent thing made me go, huh. Huh. I wonder if The Mummy the Animated Series and The Mummy Tomb of the Dragon Emperor share a universe that diverged at some point between the first mummy and The Mummy Returns. Here's my theory. Okay, so I'm gonna need to very succinctly summarize the events of The Mummy Returns, The Mummy Tomb of the Dragon Emperor, and The Mummy the Animated Series in order for my theory to make sense. Uh, the common denominator here though is Alex, so the original mummy need not apply. For a painstakingly in-depth summary and analysis of that, please see my first video. This video is about The Mummy 1999. Here we go. Oh shit. The second mummy, the mummy returns. Imhotep is back. He's been raised by the reincarnated version of his lover, Anak Sinamun. Rick and Evie live in London, but still travel to Egypt on the reg to do a little, like, brave robbing. On one of their trips, they discover the bracelet of Anubis. Whoever possesses it can wake the Scorpion King, played by Dwayne The Rock Johnson, and do battle with him. If they win, they control the scary dog army of Anubis. Rick and Evie's precocious son, Alex, puts on the MacGuffin and accidentally starts the process of waking the Scorpion King. He is immediately kidnapped by Imhotep and the cult that woke him who wanted the bracelet anyway. The bracelet shows Alex the way to Amsher and he leaves secret clues en route for his parents. Rick, Evie, and Jonathan tail them in a dirigible piloted by a second Jonathan, while Ardith Bay and the Magi army follow on horseback. The heroes catch up with Alex and Imhotep's team in the Oasis, fights a bunch of pygmy mummies, and Rick races the sun to get Alex to the pyramid on time. Evie gets killed, Evie comes back, Imhotep and Rick kind of team up to fight a bad CGI The Rock, Evie and Anox and Amun do a girl boss fight, Rick kills the Scorpion King, thereby getting control of the army of Anubis and orders them all to go to hell. They do the whole big bad dead army turns to dust when the main guy is killed thing. Imhotep and Rick are hanging off the edge of a cliff. Evie saves Rick. Anox and Amun runs away in terror and is eaten by scarabs. Imhotep falls into the underworld. The second Jonathan shows up again with his dirigible just in time to save everyone as the oasis implodes. The end. 
In the third mummy, the mummy tomb of the dragon emperor, an adult Alex discovers the tomb of Emperor Qin Shi Huang of China of terracotta army fame. Evie, played in this entry by Maria Bello, is a pulpy romance novelist who has made her career writing books loosely based on the sexy adventure she takes with her husband, Rick. Just as an aside, within mummy fandom, the recasting of Evie is a universally reviled decision. Allegedly, Rachel Weisz declined to come back for the third film because she rightly believed in 2008 she was too young to play a 21-year-old's mother. But there's also rumors that she read the lackluster script and decided that it wasn't for her. Recasts are just generally kind of awkward, and I think Maria Bello does a fine job and I kind of feel bad that she gets all this online hate for it. But I really think that Mummy fans' anger about Evie in the third movie is misplaced. I think the decision to retcon Evie's character from a capable and, by the time of the second film, respected Egyptologist to a romance novelist is disappointing. And I think it did a huge disservice to a woman who was arguably the protagonist of the first entry in the franchise. Like, I, I mean no shade on romance novelists, that's a fine line of work. But it is like a, a weird turn for a character who spent the very first film motivated by a desire to prove herself as an academic. I mean, I don't know, like, I guess everyone's gotta have hobbies. But the chiclet angle in the third film is also compounded by the fact that Evie is characterized as this like sexually frustrated housewife. And in the film, her motivation is a desire to like be horny for her husband again. And you know, it, establishing within the text of the film a lack of sexual desire between our two lead characters really kind of fucks with the chemistry between Fraser and Bello. And Rick and Evie ultimately agree to the quest in the movie because they think it will make their sex lives good again, which just honestly isn't a very compelling objective for the two leads of an action-adventure series. Back over here. Rick and Evie are asked by the British government to repatriate the Eye of Shangri-La back to China, which, yeah. <laughs> they agree because Evie thinks it will make them horny again. But before they can, oh no, the eye awakens the dragon emperor and he's bad because of a doomed love story pretty similar to the one from the first mummy, except the emperor is the cuckolded party in the love triangle, like, like the pharaoh in the first film. The lady he lusted after was a sorceress called Ji Yuan, and when the emperor caught her getting busy with his BFF, he stabbed her and she turned the emperor and his army into terracotta. Also, she's immortal. Um, and, and so is her daughter, who serves as Alex's love interest in the movie. The O'Connells now need to stop Qin Chi Huang from getting to Shangri-La before he awakens his terracotta army. And they breach the Great Wall of China, at which point they will become invincible and allow the Dragon Queen... Nope, not Queen. <laughs> That's Daenerys. And allow, I'm, I'm leaving that one in, and allow the Dragon King to dominate the earth. You know, the usual. The team fights some yetis. There's a storyline with Rick and Alex estranged at the top of the movie, but then they learn to like each other again. Evie and Rick get their mojo back. Zhe Yuan raises an army of undead soldiers to fight the terracotta army, making Yuan and Lin no longer immortal, because she sacrifices that so that she can get an army of zombies. Alex and Lin fall in love, Yuan and the Emperor fight, he kills her, Rick and Alex manage to kill the Emperor, the terracotta army is defeated, the undead army goes back to being dead, and the heroes return to Shanghai where Jonathan says he plans on moving to Peru where he thinks there are no mummies, teasing a fourth movie that never happened. <sighs> The Mummy the Animated Series follows the O'Connell family after the Manacle of Osiris attaches itself to Alex O'Connell. Imhotep, who is voiced by Winnie the Pooh, is awoken again by a co-worker of Evie's at the British Museum of Antiquities called Colin Weasler after he is passed over for a promotion in favor of Evie. He's supposed to be kind of the Benny of the series. Like, I 
gay-coded, petty British Benny. The O'Connells travel the world trying to locate the lost scrolls of Thebes in order to remove the manacle, but they quickly drop the bracelet as bad angle from the second live action movie and, and decide that actually the manacle is cool and good because it gives Alex superpowers. So they end up destroying the scrolls at the end of the first season so that the manacle can't be removed because, you know, Otherwise, what if Imhotep gets it? Then Ardeth Bey invites Alex to come train as a Magi, and the second season is renamed The Mummy Secrets of the Magi and follows Alex O'Connell's training as a Magi, as well as other adventures that the O'Connells get up to, fighting various monsters and searching for various artifacts. Often Imhotep is conveniently searching for the same artifacts, so he's just like, there, he just like shows up all the time. I know he's a big bad, but he's there so much that he just kind of becomes like more of an annoying obstacle that the O'Connells have to get over to get to where they're going. They're like, oh God, here he is again, that fucking guy. Because we got to deal with him before we can get to the end of the episode. <laughs> In one episode, Evie and Imhotep even team up to rescue Alex, Rick, and Jonathan from some bird women because the bird women had a flute that Imhotep wanted. It's, I don't know, it's, it's, eventually it is revealed that Alex, the sole non-Egyptian Magi trainee, is a prophesied supreme Magi. The most Magi. Sure. So the animated series also retcons a few other details from the first and second films. In The Mummy Returns, Rick reveals that he grew up in an orphanage, but in The Mummy, the animated series, he did know his family. He just had a father who walked out on him at a young age, and then they have an episode where that father returns, and they do a whole Indiana Jones, Henry Jones Sr. thing, but learn to accept each other. And you find out at the end of the episode that Rick's dad is also a Magi. The show also reveals that Rick went to school with Babe Ruth. <laughs> and there's an episode where they travel to New York City and Rick runs into Babe Ruth again and Babe is like, hurry back from your adventure, Rick. We need you to win the big game. And he does. He hurries back from his adventure and he plays baseball with Babe Ruth. And in the very next episode, they all have to travel to Germany to save Evie's former math teacher. And that math teacher's name was Albert Einstein. <laughs> And then there's Alex's accent. In The Mummy, the animated series, and The Mummy, the Tomb of the Dragon Emperor, he has a general American accent. But in The Mummy Returns, he's English. So you remember how I said in The Mummy, the Tomb of the Dragon Emperor, Evie is retconned to be this pulpy romance novelist and how that seemed like a really weird decision for me. Let's just say for the sake of argument that the events of The Mummy and The Mummy Returns happened within the same universe. So after the events of the first film, the O'Connells return to Cairo and then eventually to London with a whole bunch of treasure from the lost city of Hominoptera and these crazy stories about a mummy and the lost city imploding. And it seems really weird, but there's also like these news reports out of Cairo about like, weird natural events resembling the 10 plagues of Egypt that almost seem to corroborate the O'Connell stories. So this gets the O'Connells like a lot of media attention. Like the 1920s newspapers in our own timeline when Howard Carter discovered King Tut's tomb, the 1920s newspapers in the O'Connell's timeline just eat that shit up. They're just like going to town running sensationalist stories about the curse of the mummy. And the notoriety from this garners Evie the attention of a number of archeological societies, including the Bembridge scholars. And when she proves herself to be a formidable Egyptologist, she becomes something of a darling in the industry. Eight or nine years later, the events of the mummy returns happen and the O'Connells are once again in the papers. But this time their young son, Alex is involved. So the O'Connells earn this reputation as like this family of adventurers and people just eat this shit up. Like 1930, 30s people loved shit like that. And among the members of the public who are captivated by the exploits of the O'Connells is a young American novelist. Let's call her Mer Mary Bella. 
Mary Bella. Inspired by the adventures of the O'Connells, Mary Bella publishes a number of serialized stories starring an Americanized boy wonder version of Alex O'Connell called Secrets of the Magi. In the 1930s and 40s in our real universe, serialized stories published in magazines were huge hits, especially among young boys. So after the success of the serial, she starts publishing this series of adventure novels throughout the 1940s. The latest of these sees the fictionalized versions of the O'Connells go on a hair-raising journey to China to defeat the Dragon Emperor and his terracotta army. So in our real world, the terracotta soldiers weren't discovered until 1974, but Maybe in the O'Connell's world, they were discovered in the post-war period. And maybe Mary Bella becomes kind of infamous for this sort of shameless, rip from the headline style of story writing. And, you know, the O'Connell's, especially Evie, are like kind of annoyed by it. And they've written her a bunch of polite letters to please stop but you know she's technically not breaking any kind of like existing intellectual property laws at the time so there's not really anything they can do about it they just have to live with it so that would bring us up to the cancelled fourth film. At the end of the third movie in the Mummy franchise, Jonathan teases a fourth film by saying he's gonna move to Peru where there are no mummies and it's, it's a joke because famously there are mummies in Peru. And shortly after the release of The Mummy Tomb of the Dragon Emperor, a fourth installation was announced. Maria Bello and Brendan Fraser had already signed on to reprise their roles from the third film, and Antonio Banderas had signed on to play the antagonist. Eventually, we even got a working title. The Mummy, Rise of the Aztec, which is not Peru. The Aztec Empire was in modern-day Mexico, but it is another pre-Columbian civilization that practiced mummification, so, like, fine, whatever, it works. Only scant details about the cancelled film were ever leaked. This is from the Wikipedia page about it. The year is 1950, and the O'Connells, following the publishing of another book, Tomb of the Dragon Emperor, have taken to the adventure trade again. Alex, however, has disbanded from them following the death of his love, Lynn. He, however, while in Borneo, fell in love with environmental researcher Maria Derlito, Bryce Dallas Howard. He proposes to her and soon finds the engagement under trouble. Jonathan has disappeared and his father Rick and mother Evelyn have taken off on a rescue mission which includes bringing Alex home. They, however, are separated and abducted. Rick by a group of Spaniards looking for the lost Aztec gold unaware of the evil Spaniard before them who has became a living mummy. Evie ends up in a slave trade by Peruvians whom are planning an enormous sacrifice in the future days to appease the mummy. So yeah, I hate that. Let's scrap it. Let's go with Aztec mummies. So I do think that where the mummy, the animated series and the Tomb of the Dragon Emperor went right was expanding the adventures of the O'Connells outside of Egypt. Like I know canonically Evie is an Egyptologist, but She's always doing archaeology in the series. She, she's an archaeologist in practice. So inevitably, her work would take her outside of Egypt. And maybe back in the O'Connell's timeline, Rick and Evie have gotten this reputation as like the mummy people. And anytime someone discovers a mummy, they call them to make sure that they aren't gonna accidentally unleash some curse upon all mankind. Like Evie is just like constantly getting letters from terrified farmers in Scotland and Ireland when they find bog people. And she's having to be like, no, it's fine. Like it's, it's not a curse. It's just some guy that had a really unlucky fall 10,000 years ago. But then one day Rick and Evie played by Brendan Fraser and Rachel Weisz to appease the fans, get a call from an archeologist in Mexico who Evie really respects. Like maybe they've never met before, but Evie's read a bunch of their work and they're totally legit. And they say they were on a dig in the Valley of Mexico and they found this really, really unusual mummy, like unlike anything they'd ever seen before. Maybe they found like a fragment of a tablet in a Nahuatl language that uh, seems to imply that 
there might be a curse of some sort. Evie being Evie says, of course we'll come help you. Like she immediately commits the O'Connells to the quest, but her expertise is in Egyptology. So she's going into this adventure with a little bit of a disadvantage this time. She can't just rattle off information about this ancient culture off the top of her head like she can with ancient Egyptians. But you know, she's Evie, so she throws herself into her homework with characteristic zeal. She checks out a bunch of books like, when I. Suppose I simply must learn more about the Aztecs. And Rick puts up a big stink about it, like she's putting them in danger again and everything, but we all kind of know that he's secretly a little bit excited to be going on another adventure. British Alex is all like grown up and suave and he's this terminal bachelor who's always in the British tabloids because he's a little bit of a bad boy, a wild child, but he's still like, really refined and educated and he's been going on adventures since he was eight. He just never really seems to settle down and like Rick doesn't get it at all because Rick settled down with the first librarian he laid eyes on. And Alex is kind of concerned for his parents' well-being because you know, they're getting on in age now and they're about to go on a dangerous adventure. So he finds a way to kind of insert himself into the adventure. Jonathan meets them in Mexico. Jonathan did move to Peru exactly like he said he would do at the end of the third film. But while in Peru, he gets radicalized to support the socialists under Odria's dictatorial regime. You know, he's no longer living a life of luxury with the enormous house and fortune that he and Evie inherited from their parents. And in his new home country, he's forced to witness these sort of gradual restrictions of civil liberties and rampant corruption. So he's still fundamentally the same old Jonathan, but you know, like, maybe hardened somewhat, maybe a little bit less cowardly. Maybe he even pulls an Indiana Jones and like helps his new friends in South America fight former Nazis who repatriated there after the war. And maybe he even brings some of his new young friends from the APRA with him to Mexico. I don't know, I just feel like it'd be cool if we got to see Jonathan have a little growth. So the O'Connells are all reunited in Mexico and who should turn up out of the blue? but Mary fucking Bella. Hopefully played by Maria Bello. She heard through the grapevine that the O'Connells were on their way to Mexico to investigate a new mummy and decided to tag along in order to get material for her next book. And there's just nothing they can do to get rid of her. Mary and Evie have this real like, Courtney Cox and Parker Posey in Screen 3 dynamic. And maybe even Rick lampshades the fact that Maria Bello played her by like making some offhand remark about how much she looks like Evie. The archeologist shows the O'Connells the unusual mummy. It is that of a Spanish conquistador who committed unspeakable acts against the Aztec people sometime in the 15th century. Maybe they can like ramp up the gruesome on his curse as well. Like Imhotep had his eyes and his tongue cut out and then was eaten by scarabs. Maybe this conquistador was flayed alive and then had all of his skin replaced before he was mummified in a ceremony similar to Aztec mummification. Then some MacGuffin reawakens the conquistador who is played by Antonio Banderas and something something they need to stop him or doom for all the world. The stakes are higher this time because Evie is out of her depth when it comes to Aztec mythology and history. Like, she gets a lot of help from the archeologist, but ultimately the whole reason they called on the O'Connells was because this was something they'd never encountered before. And Rick is sort of getting on in years and he doesn't really want to admit it, but he's having to rely more and more on Alex and maybe on Jonathan's young socialist compadres for the brute strength and stuff. And maybe he does something stupid, like he maybe he pushes himself a little bit too hard or, or tries to showboat in front of the younger men and almost gets someone killed. And this moment really makes him have to step back and take a look at himself and think, well, what is my identity if I'm not you know, the young, adventurous, brute strength man that I was. But you know, eventually he comes to accept himself and his accomplishments by the end of the movie, and he does still get to achieve some like real heroics, and Alex and all of the young socialists come to really respect him for it. Maybe depending on how old the archeologist is, they can have like a nice little love story arc with Alex, and we can kind of get some closure on the whole bachelor thing. Like he's always lived this sort of, shallow, privileged life, but this plucky Mexican archeologist who came from nothing and made something out of themselves 
you know, really got to him. I don't know. I'm not super invested in everything needing a romantic subplot, but Hollywood sure is. At some point on the adventure, Mary Bella's creativity as a novelist helps the group out in some way. Like, maybe they encounter some kind of obstacle that she very easily bests because it was something she came up with in one of her novels. Or maybe it's like a common literary trope and just nobody gets it except for her because the only person in the team who has any time to read is Evie and all she ever reads is nonfiction anyway. So everyone kind of comes to accept Mary Bella as a part of the team because of that. And then maybe at the end of the story, after they've all, you know, worked together to beat the conquistador and send him back to hell, Mary Bella says something like, I think I'm done writing about the O'Connells. I think it's high time I write about my own adventures now. And then when the O'Connells board their plane back to London, we see Evie reading one of her Aztec books, but then the camera pans and we see she's actually tucked one of Mary Bella's novels inside and is reading that. And then maybe as soon as Rick and Evie and Alex get back to London and all settled in, they get a phone call from Jonathan asking if they'd mind turning around and heading back to the Americas because he heard through the grapevine that something mummy related is going down in the Andes and thought they might check it out, you know teasing a possible fifth movie. Steven Summers, are you listening? Steven, make the movie, Steven. Steven, make the mummy the rise of the Aztec. Make it the way I told you to make it, Steven. Steven, Steven, are you listening? Steven, we can forget that the mummy tomb of the dragon emperor was a bomb. Steven, just make the movie. Make the movie, Steven. Make the movie. Steven, make the movie. Steven, Steven, make the movie. Hey guys, uh, thank you for watching yet another mummy video from me. Um, so uh, I wanted to say hello and welcome to all of my new subscribers and especially to my new Patreon patrons. Um, I think technically it's supposed to be the $9 tier and above that gets like a a vocal shout out, uh, but I've only just broken the double digits on my Patreon patrons, so I figure let's reward everybody who got in there nice and early, regardless of what they could donate a month, um, especially, you know, in uh, this, uh, the year of our Lord 2021. Um, so a special thank you to this Uru face. Um, oh God, I didn't look up how to pronounce anybody's names, but I think this is Anai Escobar Matters, Atomic Banana, Christian Weiss, David L.F., Ava Caniva, Jillian Blumendale, Graham P., Jason Dunlap, Crazy Kaiser, Nancy Hoopman, hi mom, and Rob Rulland. Thank you so much for, uh, for donating. I, I deeply appreciate it. I'm, uh, just so thrilled and honored that you would, uh, throw your pennies in the bucket towards my tiny little operation. Um, I love you guys. Take care of yourselves. Uh, everybody watching, take care of yourselves and I'll see you in the next video.